Netanyahu, often affectionately referred to as Bibi, but not in this video, is the longest serving Prime Minister of Israel and also the Prime Minister who's been in charge for most of the period since the Oslo peace process. If you pay attention to Israel and Palestine, you would know that there hasn't been a lot of progress on peace in the last 30 years. And Netanyahu gives a reason for this. He says that the people of Israel and I are prepared to make such an historic peace. But we must have a Palestinian partner who's equally prepared to make this peace. You make peace, but only with an enemy that wants peace. The real question is, do the Palestinians want peace with Israel? I'm prepared to negotiate a final agreement, but I need a partner. As we're doing right now, and negotiate peace. I'm ready to do it. Is President Abbas ready to do it? In order to be a good partner for peace, you need to actually want peace. You need to be willing to compromise. You need to be trustworthy. You need to be legitimate to the people you represent. And you need to be able to control your coalition partners. And I couldn't help but wonder, was Netanyahu really a partner for peace? If you're watching this video contemporaneously, Israel is currently at war and things are not looking good for Netanyahu. But Netanyahu really knows how to win in a situation where it looks like he's going to lose. So I've decided to investigate whether or not he really is a partner for peace. Over three videos, I'm going to look into his influences. I'm going to look into his track record when it comes to the peace process. And we're going to investigate the level of legitimacy he has with the Israeli public and the amount of control he has over his coalition partners. I want to put a disclaimer up front. If you're the kind of person who loves dates and locations and coordinates, this video is going to be underwhelming for you. That's not the kind of history I'm interested in. It's not the way I learn. This is very much a study of personality, relationship and context. So definitely use it as a springboard. I've put a lot of resources below and I've also linked some videos of historians I think are really good in this area on YouTube. But back to Benjamin. I wanted to start with Vladimir Ziev Jabotinsky, who I think has the biggest ideological influence on Netanyahu, other than maybe Ayn Rand, which is why he has a degree in architecture. But Jabotinsky is the one who shapes his views on Zionism and the state of Israel. Jabotinsky is the intellectual father of Likud and he's very important to the Netanyahu family. Netanyahu's dad Ben Zion is his personal assistant and confidant. He's a pallbearer at his funeral. Benjamin Netanyahu has also identified himself as a student of Jabotinsky, saying that he was proud to follow his path. At the founding of Israel, there were two main Zionists charging the path. That is David Ben-Gurion and Jabotinsky. A lot of people think Zionism is a reaction to anti-Semitism and it is, but it more specifically is a reaction to the failures of emancipation and liberalism in Europe to fix the problems of anti-Semitism. Take for instance the Dreyfus Affair, a secular Jewish man who for all intents and purposes is as French as you get, still taking the fall when push comes to shove because he is othered because he is Jewish. Early Zionism is very fringe and very intellectual. Some of the first thinkers really push to make the Jewish people into a Hegelian subject, which just means there are people with a shared history and a shared future that have a material dimension. So in this case, the material dimension is the land of Israel. So the Jewish people stop being the people of a religion and start being the people of a nation. In the early days of the Yishuv, which is what we call the Jewish community in Palestine prior to the establishment of the state of Israel. Zionism was very socialist. David Ben-Gurion was very influenced by socialist thinkers, but realized it's kind of hard to have a working class revolution when you don't have a working class. And therefore his style of Zionism believed that a Jewish working class had to be created. And that meant that Jewish diaspora had to move to the lands of Israel and give up their life in the mercurial class or the intelligentsia and work the land and become a working class. And only through that would a true Jewish identity be cultivated. This working class would create in Palestine a socioeconomic infrastructure that would make the request for a state a viable possibility at the right moment. For Jabotinsky and the revisionist party, this was a complete waste of time. A state wasn't earned, it was demanded. While David Ben-Gurion was more into cautious diplomacy and pioneering, Jabotinsky was into the political military aspects of the state. 
David Ben-Gurion loved socialism, Jabotinsky hated it. He had a very different idea about how society should be organized. It was the 1930s, so his opposition to a socialist state organization wasn't a laissez-faire liberal economic order, it was much more a hierarchical, state-controlled kind of ideology. He was much more interested in a corporate society, he liked Mussolini's Italy, Salazar's Portugal, or Dolphus's Austria. Jabotinsky's Zionism was also a reaction to liberalism, which he had very much fallen out of love with. For him, liberalism was nothing more of a dream of justice without violence, which relied on the sympathy, tolerance, and goodness of men, things that he had absolutely no confidence in. In 1910, he wrote a book, Homo Homini Lupus, which translates to man is a wolf to man. Um, in fact, he even changed his name. He took the Hebrew name Ziev, which means wolf, because he so strongly adhered to this idea. In that work, he declares that liberalism is dead, and one of the main themes is that just because someone has been impressed, we shouldn't assume that they won't go on to oppress others who are weaker than them. That's a silly assumption. Stupid is the person who believes in his neighbor, good and loving as the neighbor may be. Stupid is the person who relies on justice. Justice exists only for those whose fists and stubbornness make it possible for them to realize it. Do not believe anyone. Be always on guard. Carry your stick always with you. This is the only way of surviving in this wolfish battle of all against all. He very much bought into the idea that every man was a king. All men act on their instincts and impulses to gain power and domination. And a huge reason for this is because Jabotinsky believed that European culture was simply superior to non-European culture. And that was part of what he thought was a merit to Zionism. Jabotinsky really felt that Zionism was an expression of European culture. And therefore the Zionist product, the state of Israel, would be an expression of European culture in the Middle East. In 1913, he wrote a piece called on race, which is always a good start. In this piece, he asserts that every nation has a racial component that all of its citizens share, and therefore race and nation actually overlap. And he went on to say that physical appearance and intellectual capacity are actually connected, and therefore every race has a particular psychology to them. And then he said that a uniformity in that psychology is necessary for the nation. Jabotinsky wanted to take things further than the nation. He wanted to cement the idea that the Jewish people were objectively and scientifically a race. And this makes sense because at the time, in the 1860s and 70s, the reforms that had taken place in the Russian Empire meant that ideas like Lamarckism and Darwinism were really strong. There was a lot of blood and soil rhetoric. And race science, something that had often been used against the Jewish people, Jabotinsky wanted to operationalize in their favor. So he really saw race as the collective body of a nation and something that was important to keep intact. One of the concepts from Jabotinsky that Netanyahu brings up quite a lot is the Iron Wall. It's basically an acknowledgement of resistance. There will be resistance to the state of Israel, and in order to overcome that resistance, we need an iron wall. That means a security apparatus that is able to fend them off, but also a stronger international power. Jabotinsky was a realist, and by his assessment, no voluntary or peaceful agreement was a possibility with the Arabs at that time or in the foreseeable future. Therefore, Zionists had two choices. They could either give up their Zionist ambitions, or they could continue and just be indifferent to the attitude of the Arabs. But in choosing the second path, it would be necessary to always negotiate and be in a position of military strength. <laughs> הם בני אדם, הם לא יתיחו את הראש בקיר לנצח. אבל אם הם רואים בקיאים בקיר, אם הם רואים שחלק מהקיר נהרס, אז ודאי שימשיכו. And importantly, Jabotinsky was very wed to Eretz Israel. This was an essential part of his Zionism. Israel had to include all the territory from the river to the sea, including Judea, Samaria, and Gaza. Now, Jabotinsky is very clear in his work that Palestinian violence towards the state of Israel is anti-colonial and can be understood. It is natural for people to resist colonialism. And of course, today, his ideological heirs would refute that entirely. They would characterize all Palestinian resistance as pure terrorism or aimless violence. But we will learn exactly how that evolution of thought occurs throughout the video. Jabotinsky is a very military-minded man. There has to be the ability to militarily put down one's enemy. And we see that in Jabotinsky's life. He sets up the first Jewish mule corps. He sets up the first Jewish regiments in the British army. 
His youth movement, Beta, which he trains like a, a mini military, eventually provides a lot of the fighters for the Urgon and the Lehi, including Menachem Begin and Yitzhak Shemir. So now I want to talk about Likud, Netanyahu's political party, which is ideologically aligned with Jabotinsky. Likud is traditionally made up of the fighting family, so that is the veterans of the Irgun and the Lehi, the Jewish paramilitaries, and their children, which is a generation known as the heirs. Throughout the years, they've been quite tight-knit and ideologically quite an insular group. In the last 46 years, Likud has only had four leaders, which is crazy. Now for Likud, the original sin is very much the partition and the Zionists who agreed to the partition. Likud has been led by Menachem Begin, Yitzhak Shamir and Ariel Sharon, all of whom could be considered terrorists by a definition provided by Netanyahu himself in his book Terrorism, How the West Can Win. He defines terrorism as the deliberate and systematic murder, maiming and menacing of the innocent to inspire fear for political ends. Begin, leader of the Irgun, is famous for ordering the attack on the King David Hotel, the Night of Beatings and the Sergeant's Affair. Yitzhak Shamir, former leader of the Lehi, was responsible for plotting the assassinations of Lord Moyne and Count Bernardo. And who could forget Ariel Sharon, the butcher of Beirut, who was found indirectly responsible for the Sabra and Shatila massacres, one of the biggest terror attacks in the 1980s. I mean, if you're looking for experts in terrorism, look no further. I want to explain how Likud has changed over the years so that you understand the party that shapes Netanyahu and the party that he inherits. So Likud doesn't come around for a while. Once the state of Israel declares its independence, Menachem Begin, who's the leader of the Irgun, starts a party called Herut, which means freedom, um, and he really thinks he's going to win. But he doesn't. He loses to David Ben-Gurion, and David Ben-Gurion hates Begin because he thinks Begin is a terrorist. And he's not wrong. So David Ben-Gurion excludes Menachem Begin from his governments. He starts 29 years in opposition and Herut becomes Gahal and Gahal becomes Likud eventually when he realizes he probably has to moderate a little bit. While in opposition for 29 years, Menachem Begin realizes that if he's ever going to come into power, he's going to need to widen his base. So the party Likud doesn't just represent the fighting families, it also represents disaffected neoliberals, it represents uh, secular right-wingers and the ultra-religious. But the most important thing that happens during this time that gets Menachem Begin and Likud into power is he wins the support of the Mizrahim. For those of you who don't know, Mizrahi Jews are Jewish people from North Africa and the Middle East, and many of them were expelled from their countries and came to Israel in the 60s and 70s. You heard it here first, Israel's not perfect, and there's a little bit of a social divide between the Ashkenazim and the Mizrahim. So the Jews who came from Europe are the Jews who came from North Africa or the Middle East. Ben Gurion had got reparations for the Ashkenazi Jews, what happened to them during the Holocaust. So at this time, there's also significant financial difference between the Ashkenazim and the Mizrahim. Mapai is also very much ruled by the Ashkenazim and favors go out to people who are within the party. So Likud democratizes and opens up and the Mizrahim become or feel as though they become kingmakers within the party. They feel as though they're represented and Menachem Begin talks to the Mizrahim with a level of respect. He doesn't talk down to them. <laughs> שהמפלגה השלטת במשך 29 שנים גירתה איזה מידה של התנסות מעל ציבור זה. ואני יכול לתת רחות רבות, אבל החשבות בהן הן דווקא האחרונות. למשל, דיבור על שתי תרבויות. מי שאומר שיש שתי תרבויות, אומר, התרבות שלי היא גבוהה. So this very much wins the votes of a huge amount of people who come in through the 60s and 70s. In 1977, Menachem Begin wins the election, which shocks a lot of people because he's a terrorist. Begin once said, you call me a terrorist, but I call myself a freedom fighter. Everything I did was for the freedom of the Jewish people. He introduces the Likud party platform, which is important because years later, under Ariel Sharon's government, they'll still be fighting about whether or not policies align with this party platform. Some important things in the party policy include a refusal to any territorial concessions when it comes to Judea or Samaria, an insistence on settlements as an important part of the Zionist project, refusal of a Palestinian state, and a commitment to the elimination of the PLO. 
So Begin and his leadership of Likud depart in two significant ways from Jabotinsky's thought. The first is Begin cements the Holocaust in the political imaginary of Israel. Jabotinsky was very concerned about the plight of Jewish people in Europe and he foresaw something like the Holocaust occurring, but he did not live through it. He died in 1940. Begin lived through it and he did not have a good experience and he was extremely affected by it. But this meant as he continued to live his life, he saw everything through the lens of his experiences during the Holocaust. The British in Palestine were Nazis, the PLO were Nazis. Jews lived in a constant state of fear. <laughs> For Jabotinsky, Arab hostility had been a natural reaction to the Zionist project. But for Begin, Arab hostility was rooted in anti-Semitism. He tended to concentrate all of the historical fears and anxieties of the Jewish people onto whatever issue he was focused on at the time. And he ended up being dubbed the High Prince of Fear. This also exaggerated his desire for that Jabotinskyan iron wall defense of Israel. The other major thing is that Begin really introduces religion back into Israeli society. Under Ben-Gurion, Israel was very secular. It was respectful, but it was secular. Begin really reintroduced religion into politics. He brought religious parties into government. He made their members ministers. He gave more money to religious communities. He exempted their students from compulsory military service. He often used religious language and referred to religion in public addresses. And he regularly referred to the Jewish identity. This was in part to play to his Mizrahim base, which was much more religious than the Ashkenazim, but it was also just because he was a more religious man. Begin eventually resigns because he's had enough. That's literally the reason he gives. I can't take it. And Begin is replaced by Yitzhak Shamir, who is also a terrorist, but he's a little bit boring. He's definitely not as emotional, maybe more nationalistic, but what is important is he's the first prime minister to really save his government by making alliances with some extremely fringe parties. The other thing worth noting about Yitzhak Shamir is the way he handles his relationship with the United States of America in regard to the peace process. Begin had a tumultuous relationship with the US, but Yitzhak Shamir was truly the definition of immovable. Shamir frustrated the American administration to no end because on the surface he would agree to certain actions, he'd smile and nod, and then he would go home and do the opposite. Is Israel going to take part in the next part, uh, part of this uh, peace negotiation? Is it just a matter of working out detail? Do you have every hope of taking part? Sure, it's not a matter of principle. And you know, we are interested in this process. This process is based to a large extent, on our proposals, on our principles. And we want to go along with it. The matter now is uh, about some details, important details, but they could be worked out. So, so you're leaving America uh, feeling that this process is still on track. Perhaps it's been slowed down, but it has not collapsed. It has sure, not come to an sure, end. Sure, there is no doubt about it. There's no doubt, and uh, nobody could imagine that because of such a detail, this uh, process uh, will collapse. He put in Ariel Sharon as the Minister for Housing, and this man would eventually be known as the father of settlements for his extreme commitment to building settlements beyond the green line at a rapid pace. One American aide was even delightfully quoted to have said, we know what the game is, no one is getting Shamir pregnant. Good faith, affirmative effort, on the part of our good friends in Israel. And if we don't get it, and if we can't get it quickly, I have to tell you, Mr. Levine, that, that uh, everybody over there should know that the telephone number is 1-202-456-1414, 
When you're serious about peace, call us. Now, I don't want to talk about Sharon here, even though he's also led Likud. I'm going to talk about him in the next video because Netanyahu is in Sharon's government. But I do want to look at what Benjamin was doing during this period of time that we just discussed and what other ideas shape him and influence him into the man he is today. Despite his close relationship with Ziv Jabotinsky, Ben Zion Netanyahu, Benjamin's dad, was not a fighter. He was an academic and not a particularly well-liked one at that. He felt that he was discriminated against by the University of Haifa and as a result took a job in America, which is why Benjamin and his brother Jonathan grow up moving between Philadelphia in America and Israel. If you're familiar with Israel, you will be familiar with Yoni Netanyahu, Benjamin's brother. He's a bit of a hero, but in these early days, he is a hero in the eyes of one man and one man only, and that is Benjamin. Benjamin loves his brother. And in 1964, Yoni leaves Benjamin in America to go and join the IDF and trains to become a paratrooper. Fighting is really important for Benjamin and Jonathan. The fact that their dad didn't fight is kind of a cause of embarrassment, especially if you're a revisionist Zionist, if you're in that right wing, fighting is really important and it's important to access political power. Then the six day war breaks out and Netanyahu is a senior in high school, but he actually skips his graduation to go and join the IDF and help. He's not trained at that time. So he digs trenches just so he can be involved in the war. And this war is a very important event in Netanyahu's life. If you grew up in the Netanyahu household, you believed that everyone was coming for the Jewish people at all times. Ben Zion was very committed to the idea that Jewish people were under threat. And the Six Day War demonstrated that to be true. His dad's fatalistic theory completely comes true, but it's a happy ending. Israel wins. So then he's completely all in with the IDF. He becomes a member of the Sayeret Matkal, which is like the Israeli version of the Navy SEALs. It's a super secret counterterrorism group that no one even knew about until the 90s. And he starts doing all these like crazy hostage rescue missions. He's also obsessed with being physically fit at this time. And eventually he organizes for his brother to be transferred into the Sayeret Matkal. Then he gets injured. He gets shot in the shoulder by friendly fire in 1972 while rescuing victims of a plane jacking. And he returns to America to study for a while, do his Ayn Rand architecture degree. The 4th of July, 1976 is one of the most important formative days in Netanyahu's life. Israeli forces blitz an airport in Uganda where a plane has been hijacked and Yoni is shot and killed during the mission. <laughs> הלכתי למטבח, הרמתי את השפורפרת, שמעתי את קולר של עידו, הוא אומר, ביבי יוני נהרג. אני לא יודע איך הוא משל בעצמו, אני, אני רק זוכר שבאותו רגע חרב עליי עולמי. Immediately, Benjamin and his father go to work to memorialize Yoni as a hero, and no doubt he is. But the myth of Yoni becomes much bigger than the man. Benjamin and Ben Zion have a book written, they have his letters published, they have a movie made. Today, Yoni is very much a cult figure in Israel, known as a war hero and a poet, an incredibly complex soul. The death of Yoni isn't seen as just a loss for the Netanyahu's, but a loss for the state of Israel. Yoni's memory as a war hero does does a lot for the Netanyahu's to make up for the fact that Ben Zion wasn't part of that original veteran generation. And to this day, if you want FaceTime with Netanyahu, it's known that you should go and visit Yoni's grave first. From this point on, Benjamin rebrands himself as a terrorism expert. He starts going on Officer, shows was, talking uh, about terrorism. Uh, I fought uh, terrorists many times. He starts writing books about terrorism. He starts holding conferences about terrorism. He establishes something called the Jonathan Institute, which is made to fight terrorism. In 1979, he holds an international symposium on terrorism. All sorts of people are there. Menachem Begin comes, which is a huge step forward in terms of being accepted by the Likud elite. Do not expect to overcome your own terrorism if you open offices of the PLO in your capitals. George Shultz is there, many American neoconservatives are there, George H.W. Bush is there. And this is his first attempt to spin the battle against Palestinians as the same as the battle that the United States is fighting against other kinds of terrorism. And the objective invariably is not to attack Bulgaria, it's not to attack 
Budapest. It's mm -hmm. always American targets or Western targets or what they call the Zionist imperialist conspiracy. Insurgents who fight political powers are always terrorists. And if you look at how Netanyahu has spoken about the PLO or the PA or Hamas throughout his leadership, it very much aligns with whatever America is focused on at the time. To begin with, all Palestinian terrorism came from the Soviet. Fighting terrorism was fighting communism. Well, there, there certainly is a, a great deal of Soviet involvement with all of these groups. Then of course it became Saddam Hussein. Pushed the United States into war and there's a report out of Jerusalem that Israel is demanding a commitment from the United States that America put an end to the Iraqi military threat. I don't know about uh, these reports. I do know what our policy is. Uh, we share, in fact, the policy with the United States. Because, you see, what is uh, threatened by Iraq is not just Israel. Everybody is threatened by Iraq. Then it became Al-Qaeda. You don't think Yasser Arafat's behind these attacks, do you? I think what we have, and we alluded to this, is a network. Uh, of terror. There's an entire terror. Hamas has just attacked you, Mr. President, and the United States for ridding the world of bin Laden. So Israel obviously cannot be asked to negotiate with a government that is backed by the Palestinian version of Al-Qaeda. Then it became ISIS. Hamas is ISIS. And just as ISIS was crushed, so too will Hamas be crushed. And Hamas should be treated exactly the way ISIS was treated. Whatever is a totalizing threat to the West, the Palestinians are presented as connected and synonymous with that. The free world is at war. It's at war with international terrorism. This war is arranged by states. And the question is, what do you do against a factory that produces the modern plague, the viruses of the modern plague, which is terrorism? What do, I we, think, do? What do we do? Well, I think what we have to do is arrest the disease and strike at the centers of this uh, of this uh, cancer. Netanyahu publishes multiple books on terrorism, and in his 1986 book, Terrorism, How the West Can Win, he claims that the only way you can combat terrorism is to weaken and destroy the terrorist's ability to consistently launch attacks, even at the risk of civilian casualties. He argues that the terrorists won't engage in terror if the risk is too great, a claim he supports with nothing and no causes for terrorism are offered except for the fact that terrorism stems from Islam's confrontation with modernity and this is a claim he will repeat over and over and over and over again. The core of the conflicts in the Middle East is the battle between modernity and early primitive medievalism. The uh, terrorists uh, want to destroy our freedoms and our civilization and therefore all the free countries and all the civilized societies have to band together to fight this scourge. Uh, and if we stand together, and if we're not divided, then we can defeat this tyranny that seeks to extinguish all our freedoms. If they were to succeed, they would return humanity to a, a primitive early medievalism. I say early medievalism because my father, my late father, was a great historian of the Middle Ages, and I'd be giving them too much compliment. If you mean whose side should one be on, Israel or the Arabs, I would certainly say Israel because, think, because it's the advanced technological civilized country amidst a group of almost totally primitive savages. Terrorism is never because of legitimate grievances and always because of a predisposition to violence. His book has a clear, unspoken agenda. Occupied territories must stay under Israeli control because the Palestinian resistance to Israel is terrorism and you don't negotiate with terrorists. Now what's a man with a perfect American accent, an agenda and a sob story to do in Reagan's America? Obviously, go on television. In 1978, Netanyahu becomes the go-to Israel man for television in the United States. And an expert on terrorism. He does televised debates where he argues against Palestinian self-determination. He constantly refers to the Palestinian state as a terrorist state. And he's great at these appearances. He's got the look, he's got the voice, he's quick on his feet. He actually practices in his living room with his wife. She sets up a camera and they do interviews together. You told an anecdote about the grizzly bear. I wanted to, in light of your, your answer just now, if you could tell that again. Let me, let me stop the camera here for a second. <laughs> the, 
the attitude of uh, some governments in the West reminds me um, uh, of the story of the grizzly bear uh, that appears in the forest, uh, too. Let me say it differently. The attitude of some in the West uh, regarding terrorism reminds me of the... Uh, <laughs> shows you the difference between politicians and uh, diplomats and actors. Uh. <laughs> There's a story about two people who walk in the forest and are suddenly confronted by a grizzly bear charging at them. One of them begins to run away. The other asks him, why are you running? Don't you know you can't outrun a grizzly bear? And the man running turns around and he says, I don't have to outrun the bear. I have to outrun you. Uh, and if you watch enough Netanyahu interviews, like I have, you will notice that some of his answers to questions literally have not changed for 40 years. So anyhow, he's he's actually so good at this that in the 1980s, he is appointed to the PR team at Israel's embassy under Moshe Arendt, who is very like him. They really see themselves as modernizing Israel's approach, uh, intellectualizing Likud. They're both Likudites. And during this time, he does he does what he's good at. He warms up to politicians. He goes on television and, and pleads the case for Israel. He tells America what is happening on the ground, what Israel is up against. In 1984, Yitzhak Shabir appoints Netanyahu to be the ambassador to the United Nations. When he's working at the UN, there are a lot of issues with Lebanon, so it's really important to have someone to explain what's happening from Israel's point of view to the media in America. Netanyahu is seen as a magician. It's saying basically this. It says, we condone all Palestinian violence against Israel. We condemn any Israeli countermeasure. He wasn't really liked by some of Liquid because of his connections to America, but this is where he really learns to use it to his advantage. And he gets angry at other Likudites for not utilizing the media effectively enough. After all, Jabotinsky and his dad, who is very much a propagandist, really strongly push the idea that there is an unrelenting need for persuasion and pressure to protect Jewish interests. During the second Reagan term, Netanyahu is dubbed as the master of the soundbite. One man in the fight against terrorism. Ambassador Netanyahu is a rising star in world politics. He makes extremely strong connections during this time between Likud and the conservatives in America. He is very good at establishing Hasbara and Hasbara networks in the United States, which is uh, it's the Hebrew word for explaining. It's kind of like, uh, it's like public relations for Israel. They explain Israel's perspective on certain situations. It's the fact that the Palestinian Arabs don't have a state of their own. Well. They were offered a state of their own in 1948. They summarily rejected out of hand. They didn't want anything to do with it. And you tell me, well, that was 40 years ago. 40 years have passed. It's changed. Has it changed? And he kind of sold Hasbara as a really important way for the diaspora to feel a strong connection to Israel, something that they could easily engage in that would connect them to Israel. יש דעת קהל, יש לנו כוחות כבירים בדעת הקהל שמתנגדים למדיניות הזאת, גדולי הפרשנים. אמריקה לא תכפה לנו דבר אם לא נרצה בכך. בשנת 1986, ליקוד אקשלי אוטלו כל ישראלי שדברים עם אף אחד שעשיתם עם ה-PLO. וזה בן מתחיל את המדיה, והדיאספרה אמרה לא לקרוא את ישראל. אייב פוקסמן, שהוא חלק מהאידיאל בזמן הזמן, אמר, אם אני אסתם, זה לא יפגע את הילדים שלי. זה למה אני חושב ש... Public criticism by American Jews of Israeli security policies is arrogant and irresponsible. We don't pay consequences for our opinions, for our points of view. They pay consequences. Shamir repeated this sentiment at the President's Conference of Major Jewish Organizations in 1987. But Netanyahu, because of his natural connections to America, his keen understanding of American media and public relations, is really able to shape public narratives around Israel in a way that hadn't occurred before. And it kind of helped because both Menachem Begin and Yitzhak Shamir tended to invoke a state of siege 
in in the mind of Israelis that there was an emergency happening and we all need to band together and we can't fight because a siege is happening. And this kind of extended to the diaspora where it's like now is not the time to criticize Israel. This is our narrative, stick to it, please do this. Netanyahu's real goals during this period is to pursue uh, Hasbara, to uh, combat terrorism and to fight against media bias. And he did something very clever during this time, which was to merge Likud and Likud's policies with the state of Israel. So to criticize Likud, their ideology, their policies was to criticize Israel and to criticize Israel when Israel was under attack was irresponsible and putting Israelis in danger. And this mentality was also used when talking to American politicians like Schultz, who proposed an international conference in 1988. Netanyahu who criticized him because he'd met a member of the PNC. In 1988, Netanyahu quits his job. First Intifada is happening and it's a really difficult time to do PR for the state of Israel. And he wants to run for politics, so he goes back to Israel. After you go back to Israel, you're going to run for office. Are you going to think of us, come to the United States? If you'll invite me, if you... If you send me the ticket, definitely. But before he does that, he meets with a bunch of Republican strategists. He develops a very American election campaign. He's a very big image guy. When he goes back, he takes caravans with him so that he can change suits every couple of hours. So he's always in a clean suit, which was seen as, as very odd at the time, even though it's quite common now. And even though he's still seen as an outsider because of these American inclinations, he does win a seat in the Knesset. He doesn't have a ministry. He doesn't have a portfolio or anything, but he makes himself his own job. So during the Intifada, every time there is an Israeli victim in the hospital, he'll go and visit them and he will demand that international media give the Israeli victims as much coverage as they give the Palestinian. Now keep in mind, over these six years, 275 Israelis die and 1,600 Palestinians die with 2,500 Palestinian children being hospitalized for beating injuries. But the point is, this was once again a coalescence of what Netanyahu's all about. We have to combat media bias, we have to combat terrorism, and I'm gonna be the point man for it. More than any other conflict in the world, the Israel-Palestine conflict is about personality and ideology. No peace process can be reached alone. I think all of this tells us a lot about the man who's sitting on one side of the negotiating table. In the next installment of these videos, I'm gonna look at Netanyahu's track record through the peace process. So make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next part of this series on Netanyahu. The darnest way to con conduct an interview with Maybe can you tell us what you need to learn on the telephone? Well, we haven't learned much yet. We're trying to find out uh, exactly where uh, 